if Jesus can open up his palms and allow them to be nailed to a cross, and if that's what he held in his hands to leverage the cross at his death and his resurrection for your life and my life to thrive, how much more should we take what's in the palms of our hands, what we own, our resources, everything we have, to leverage that, let him transform them supernaturally, and we will walk in our destiny and purpose and calling, and it'll be a life of thriving. So glad you could join us for doing Church Online. We're in a series right now called Thrive, Living the Rhythms of Jesus. When we talk about rhythms, what we mean by that is when we align our lives and pattern our lives, our thinking, the way that we uh, align our value systems, the way that Jesus lived. When we do that, when we're in rhythm with who Jesus was, what Jesus believed and what Jesus did, it leads us to the life of thriving. You know, that's really what it means to be a disciple or a follower of Jesus. It means to live in rhythm with Jesus. And he promises that when we do that, we live life to its full, the language of thriving. Today, we're going to talk about the rhythm of leveraging. And I want to start off by reading a verse to you that I, maybe you've read this before, but this really speaks to God's destiny for your life. Here's what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Paul says, for we, and I just want to stop right there for a second, because I know a lot of us might be watching and we go, that's the other people. These passages of scripture are for everybody else but me. And when, I, when we speak into the camera right now and you're sitting wherever you are, you might be on a treadmill listening, you might be in your living room watching, I really want this to be a personal message for you. So when we read right here, for we, this is for you as a Jesus follower, this is God's plan. For we, personalize that, insert yourself into this, we are God's handiwork, or some translations say his craftsmanship, his workmanship. We are his handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God, now watch this, this is about destiny, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now the word advance there is actually connected before God created the whole world. Think about this for a moment. You're sitting wherever you are listening and you might think your life is so insignificant, you don't matter. Maybe you've struggled with that. Maybe, maybe you've woke up and you go, man, my life isn't, it doesn't have anything of purpose. There's no drive. There's no significance. I'm not accomplishing anything. I'm just a nobody. Listen, we all struggle with that. And I want to speak over you right now that whoever's listening or watching, that as we unpack over the next two weeks, what does it mean to live in the rhythm of leveraging? We would come alive and we would discover not only the destiny that God has for us, because when it says that he prepared in advance, he had you in mind, not somebody else where we do this, we go, oh, God had them in mind. God didn't have me in mind. No, everybody who's listening right now, this is about you. God had you in mind. Think about this, this will blow your mind. When God was imagining and creating and speaking out the stars and the universe, as magnificent as all of that is, God was actually thinking about you. He was planning your life. He was predestining for you that when God had you in mind, you would discover the things that he had already planned for you. That's what it means right here, that he has created us, he's formed us, he's fashioned us. This idea, of we are his handiwork. You know, God is so creative. And part of his creative masterpiece, you know, the word here for handiwork is the Greek word poema. And it means this idea. It means handiwork. It means workmanship. It means this, a masterpiece or creation fashioned together for a special purpose. I want you just to understand this right now, that you are God's masterpiece. Now, you might not think that. Because oftentimes we compare ourselves, and when we always do comparison, it robs us from discovering who God has created us to be and uniquely how God wants to use us. You, me, all of us, we are his craftsmanship. God has his fingerprints on your life. And this idea of poema, it means to create something and not let it just sit there. It means to create it because there's a plan and a purpose behind what it's created or intended to do. You think about it this way. God is a master artisan. God is so creative, but he doesn't like to create art. You know, a lot of times we look at art around us and we can admire it 
for its beauty. It's just something that may be abstract. Maybe a lot of us are going, that is me. I'm the abstract painting of God. But even abstract paintings have its own beauty and intent and purposes in it. And sometimes we can look at art and we go, it's just a paperweight. It's just sitting there. It doesn't function anything. The idea here behind this phrase that we are God's masterpiece. We are his craftsmanship. He's, he's fashioning us together. Our personalities are unique. His, even some of the quirky things that we all have, our life experiences, what what's happened to us, good and bad, all of these things, God is saying, I want to use that as something beautiful to accomplish a great purpose that even before creation, I was already planning for you to discover and live out. You know, I remember as a kid, I had a whole creative part of me. I was a creative kid. I'm still a creative adult. And I remember watching a TV show. Some of you can, can relate to this. It was called The Little Rascals. Remember, remember some of you are like, The Little Rascals. I grew up with The Little Rascals. Man, they were running around. The dog with the big old painted zero around his eye. Some of you are watching right now. The younger generation are like, I have no idea who The Little Rascals are. But the point of it was they were always creative. And I remember watching the show where they created and made their own like street racer, their own soapbox racing car. And I was like, I'm going to do that. So I went into the garage and I found anything I can. My dad's like, yeah, use whatever you want. Nails, screws, or some extra wood. I, t- I got some parts off of old bikes and just random stuff. And I got creative and I fashioned together. Like I, it was a masterpiece in my mind, this go-kart, this soapbox racer. And I was so excited painting the stripes on it. I had the seat, the steering wheel. I had a rope to the tires, everything going down the hill. It was awesome, right? But I created that not just to sit there to be admired. I actually created it to drive it, that life would be more exhilarating when I got behind the wheel of that. That's the whole point for you and I. Listen, when we discover who God has in his masterpiece way created us to be, and we align that with the destiny or the works in which he has in front of us, those come together. It leads to an exhilarating life of thriving. Let me just illustrate it this way by showing a diagram. If you were to look at two paths, on the one side you have, this is your destiny. God has predetermined special works. This is your calling, your purpose in life. God has this on this path. This is your destiny, right? But when you discovers, this is where you and I are, when we discover the workmanship of how he's shaped us, the uniquenesses, the talents, the experiences, your perspective, your personality, all those things that make you who you are. When we discover that and we join it together here and we link who we are with what God has created us to do, then that leads us to the place of thriving. But many of us, we never live in that intersection. This is what I would call the thrive zone. When you discover who you are and you use who you are, who God has made you, but you do it not for your own purposes, but you do it to bring glory to God for his purposes he's prepared for you in advance. When those intersect, this is the thrive zone for your life. This is when you wake up and you're like, wow, God created me this way and now I get to use that for his purposes. And when those link up, It's an amazing life of thriving, significance, purpose. And God has a promise to use you in that. But you're probably wondering, how how do I get there? Because I I don't know God's destiny. I don't know his plan for my life. And I'm still trying to figure out who God has made me. What does that come down to? It comes down to a question that I'm going to share with us. And it comes down to this question is this. What's in your hand? If you want to start by linking up the intersection between God working in you and the works that God has created for you to do, it starts with this question, what is in your hand? What has he already put in your hand? And when you take what's in your hand, this is who you are, and you say, okay, God, I'm going to start using that. I'm going to start volunteering. I'm going to start serving. I'm going to start taking those things, using it for your life, not just for my own gain, not just for my own success, not just for my own career or making money, but when I actually, God, take the things, who you've made me be, what's in my hand, and I start using that for you, that's when life gets really exciting. And here's the thing. We have to start by asking the question, what's in our hand? And I just want to give an opportunity right now. I'm going to lay out this week. Here's what I'm going to do. This is going to be a message over two weeks. I'm going to show you a theological theme all throughout the Bible. 
where God took people who thought they didn't have much in their hand. And when they discovered what they actually had in their hand and they gave that, they leveraged it for God's purpose, then they became the heroes of the Bible we read about today. So today, I'm going to walk us through that. Next week, I'm going to talk about how do we actually discover what's in our hand. But one of the best ways that you can start this path and get on that intersection is by serving and volunteering. That's just one way you can do that. In your church, which is Grace Chapel, or outside in our community. And so even just speaking to that, here we are, we're just literally a couple months from moving into our future home, which we're all excited about. And there's gonna be so many opportunities for us to do ministry that we can leverage that building to have a huge impact in this community and each of our lives. But here's the thing, we need a lot of you to take what's in your hand, your time, your talent, your resources, whatever you have, and start using that, serving, and that's one way to link up with the destiny that God's created for us as a church family through our future home to have a huge impact. That building that we have that we're going to move into in just a few months is part of the destiny God has us on as a church. When you take what's in your hand and say, how can I serve there? How can I volunteer? Then we're going to link up your life with God's plan for us, and we're going to see thriving, we're going to see impact, we're going to see purpose, and it's going to be amazing. So I want to give you guys real practically three ways that you that we need your help that you can step in take what's in your hand and be able to help us we're going to put it up here for many of you you this is a great spot we need a lot of leaders in our youth ministry our ardent ministry junior high and high school and as that's growing we want to invest in even more kids and we want to see their lives transform so you can take your time you can volunteer you can serve when you do that There's a great way for you to link up who you are with God's destiny and the works and plans in your life. And it leads to more of this idea of thriving. So if you're interested in that, you can sign up because we're going to have info meetings for each of these things. You're not committing yet. You're just going to go to the meeting, find out more about it, and then pray about it and decide if that's something you want to step into. So Arden is our first one. Second of all is Kid Venture. We need a lot of you to help step up and volunteer to create that space for kids to come alive in Jesus. When we open those doors, how amazing would it be that we have, a, we have so many volunteers ready to go, trained up to welcome kids, welcome families, see them come running in and be able to have an impact on their lives. Again, we have an info meeting for that and you can come that just to find out. We're not asking you to commit yet. Show up at the meeting, pray about it, and decide if that's something you want to do. And then lastly is the area of hospitality. We need people to help us do all kinds of things, parking and serving and making it be a place where people are welcomed and loved. And if you're interested in any three of these, this is a great way for you to link up with the destiny God has for us with our future home, to have an impact and for your life to feel a sense of purpose as well. So I want to encourage you, this is just one way that you guys can step in and we can see things up and running. So sign up for those, show up at one of those info meetings, see how God might use you in that space to do something amazing. So here's what we're going to do now. I'm going to walk us through the theology framework all throughout. There's a theme throughout the Bible that the people that we read about today, they started as what maybe some people would say as feeling like zeros, like God's never going to use me. I'm a nobody. We're going to start with Moses and we're going to work our way through the Bible with a handful of stories. And I want to prove the point that when we take what's in our hand and we let God leverage that for his glory and his purpose, it leads to a greater life of thriving. And we're going to start with Moses. Why do I like Moses? Because watch what happens in the life of Moses. Moses was a guy that God approached and he looked at Moses and said, Moses, I'm going to use you to lead my people out of captivity. The Jewish Hebrew people were in slavery to Egypt and God wanted to deliver them. So he calls on a guy named Moses. He's like, I have a plan for you. I'm going to use you. Moses is like, why would you use me, God? I have a speech impediment. I can't even speak clearly. You're going to use me to announce the freedom, to, to go up against the Pharaoh and actually speak against him? I can barely get a word out of my mouth. And Why would you ever use me? See, that's the point. Oftentimes we look in our hands and we go, God would never use what I have. God would never use me because we compare to what somebody else has in their hands. And we write ourselves out of our destiny. And we never live the thriving life because we'll never discover what God has for us until we take what's in our hands. So here's what God says to Moses. Exodus chapter four, verse one. Moses answered, what if they don't believe me? He's like, I'll go, okay, God, but what if they don't believe me? What if they don't believe me or listen to me? And they say, the Lord did not appear to you. Like Moses is going, God, if I go tell them, God told me, I'm going to hear stepping out. 
God wants his people free. Moses is like, they're not going to believe that I was sent by you because I'm a nobody. Now watch what happens next. Here's where it comes. Verse 2. Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? What's that in your hand? Moses is like, here's his response. Look at verse 2. He says, it's a staff. It's a rod. Like, (laughs) it's a stick. That's all I have in my hand. God's like, no, 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 you're missing it. See, this is a theological premise. Come on, this is going to be a breakthrough for many of us watching right now. He looks at Moses, who Moses thinks he's a nobody. And he looks at him and says, but what do you got? What do you got in your hand? Moses is like, I got a stick. That's all I got. That's all I got. Now watch what happens in verse 3. The Lord says to him, take what's in your hand, right? It's a stick. It's, it's nothing. What can that accomplish? God says, throw it on the ground. Moses takes the stick throws it on the ground. Watch what happens in the next verse. And it says this, Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake. God actually supernaturally transformed that rod into a snake, a serpent. And then he ran from it. So Moses drops it on the ground, turns into a snake and he runs. I would have done the same thing. And he runs from it. Then the Lord said to him, now watch, this is important. Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. That is the the snake or the stick. So Moses reached out. He took a hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. God had to show Moses something important here. God had to show Moses that God can take anything in your hand, even something as insignificant as a stick. But when God uses what you're obedient to use for him, he can supernaturally transform it into anything for his purpose. Because watch what happens the rest of the story. If you go down with me in verse 5, it says this. The Lord said to him, this is why you need to catch this. It's so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. I'm going to validate you. I'm going to use what's in your hand that you've written off as just a a, a lame old stick. But if you offer that, if you use that, I'm going to transform it into something and prove to them that my favor, my blessing and power is on you to accomplish the work of deliverance for my people in your life. Could you imagine right then? Moses had to make a choice that you and I have to make a choice. Moses could have thought, well, God, it's just a a lame stick. I'm like, I can't, I can't use that. I'm not going to do anything with that. But if you watch what happens, there's another phrase I don't want us to miss. Look with me down, Exodus chapter 4, verse 20. Watch what happens. This is, just got to catch this. Now the Lord said to Moses and Midian, Go, return to Egypt, for all the men who sought your life are dead. Then Moses took his wife and his sons and set them on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt. Now watch this. If you remember before, Moses simply just had a staff or a rod. It was a staff in Moses' hand. That was all he had. It was nothing, a stick. Now watch how that's changed now in this verse. And Moses took not the rod of Moses, the rod of God in his hand. See, what happened was when Moses took what was in his hand, it transformed it. No longer was it now called the rod of Moses. Now it's called the rod of God. Whatever you might have in your hand, it might be your time might be talent, skills, your personality. It might be your physical resources. It might be relationships, your influence, your leadership. Whatever you have, that's what God has already allowed to be in your hand. And God says, that's, that's something that's no longer called the rod of Moses. It's now called the rod of God because when God takes what's in our hand, he uses it for his purposes. And we get to step into our destiny because we leverage what's in our hand for his glory. This is why Another epic moment in Moses' life, the Red Sea crossing. Maybe you've never seen this before, but you've heard the story. Moses is there. Pharaoh is on their tail. The army is pressing in. They're now cornered. They got the army of Pharaoh that wants to kill them. They got the Red Sea. They can't move forward. They're cut off. They're up against the wall. And all the people started complaining, God, why'd you lead us here? Watch what happens in that phrase. Here's what it says in Exodus chapter 14, verse 15. It says this, then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Moses, why are you crying to me? Why are you complaining to me? This is what he tells Moses. Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. God was looking at Moses going, why are you asking me to do something? I've already provided the means, it's in your hand. 
Didn't we learn this before, Moses, that all you had to do was take the rod, touch it to the sea, and it will part? Did you not know that I can take something in your hand? I've already transformed that into something supernatural and miraculous. See, when we do accounting, we do wrong accounting. This is what the enemy wants you to do. The enemy wants you right now to think, I'm a nobody and I have nothing in my hand. It's exactly what the enemy wants you to think. And yeah, if you compare yourself to somebody else's hand, you will always feel that you're lacking. But God says, no, 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 listen, I can take anything and if you leverage it for my glory and purposes, I'll do something supernatural with it. And we see this theme all throughout the Bible. Let me give you another example. We know another famous person. Let me read this to you. This is a young boy, again, insignificant, who had to go up against a famous giant called Goliath. Now watch what happens in this phrase. If you remember the story, here's what it says in 1 Samuel 17, verse 40. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream. He put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. And what, how did the rest of the story go? He took him out. He took out the number one most intimidating enemy of God's people. Why? Not because he had the big sword that the other army thought he should have had. He had what God wanted him to use. He was a young boy. He's like, I got a slingshot. I got a slingshot. I mean, think about this. It doesn't make sense. You got the most intimidating army. Like even Goliath's sword, David couldn't even really lift. It was that heavy. I mean, the odds were against him. But you know what? When the odds are against you and you use what's in your hand, God will supernaturally use that. See, what we do is we look what's in our hand and we look at the odds and we go, I can't do anything. God would never use this to break down that. God would never use this insignificant thing in my hand to accomplish something like slaughtering an intimidating giant. But this is the theme that I want to hit on over and over this morning is what's in your hand, you leverage it. It's a slingshot, it's a stone, it's a stick. Watch what God will do. Supernaturally. Let me keep going. Let me give you another story. One of my favorite stories is the story of Esther. Here's what happened in human history. There was a Persian king named Xerxes. If you ever watched the 300 movie, which I'm not recommending, they, he's there, the Spartans, the whole thing. He was, he was a, a, an evil king. I mean, he was a king that was all about his own fame and his own glory. And so here he was King Xerxes, the Persian king, but God's people, the Hebrews, again, were in slavery. And God was going to plan to use, God had a destiny predetermined for a woman named Esther. And God was going to use her powerfully. So how was God going to, what was in her hand that God was going to use? Here's how the story goes. In Esther chapter 2, verse 9. Now the young woman, she pleased him and she obtained his favor. The way that this Persian king Xerxes worked was that he would round up the most beautiful women in the kingdom and make them his wives or slaves or servants, whatever. So again, he wasn't a good king. But here was something God wanted to do using this woman named Esther. When she showed up on the scene, what she had in her hand was favor. Favor in the eyes of the Persian king. And as it goes on, let me read a couple more. Verse 15 of chapter 2 is this, And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. What's in her hand? Favor. What's in her hand is influence. Now, as the story unfolds, here, here's how it goes. There was a plot, a guy named Haman who worked under Xerxes. Haman absolutely despised the Jews, and he started plotting to have them literally a genocide, have them all killed. He was, he was deceiving the king into this. Well, the plot became so thick that it actually was going to take out Esther. Esther was a Jew, and they didn't know this about her. And so here was King Xerxes that was going along with the plot, to genocide, to eradicate the Jewish people, to have them killed. Then word gets to Esther through a relative named Mordecai, who was very special to her. Mordecai knew he had found out about the plotting of Haman. So he goes to Esther, and this is the conversation that you've probably heard, and I have probably heard, and I want to read this to you. And this is found in Esther, and it's, I'm going to read this to you out of chapter 4, verse 14. And this is what it says. If, for if you remain completely silent, Mordecai's going to Esther. Esther, what you have in your hand is favor. Esther, you can actually go to the king. You can change the course of our lives. We're going to be killed. So Mordecai says, Esther, you've got to go before the king. And, she, and, and Esther's going, nobody goes before the king without permission. 
And Mordecai goes, wait, you can't be silent because you have favor. That's what you have in your hand. So he tells her, if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place, like somebody else God's going to bring in. Because again, God has a destiny and plan. Sometimes we miss out on living our destiny and purpose when we forfeit the opportunity. God every day says, hey, I prepared you for this. And if you don't, I'll use somebody else, but I'm going to give you the opportunity that when you leverage what you have, I'm going to write you into my supernatural story. So Mordecai tells her, listen, you've got to tell the king to change his mind. And then watch as the story goes on. It says this, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows? This is the biggest statement. Who knows whether you have come to this kingdom for such a time as this. You've heard that over and over again, that Esther's for such a time as this, it's actually linking to her destiny. It's God pre-planned for her for this very moment. And if she could leverage her favor and influence over the king, and that's exactly how the story goes. The king then favored Esther, found out about the plot, and actually had Haman killed instead of the Jews. It's this very ironic twist. It's such an amazing story. The point of it is this, is that Esther used what's in her hand. And God leveraged that for the destiny and purpose that he had for her life. Let me give you another one. You're probably familiar with this. A little boy around the time of Jesus. Jesus was out feeding the multitudes and the crowds. And it says this in John chapter 6, verse 8. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up spoke up like everybody's hungry how are we going to feed them spoke up hey there's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish now watch this of course this is the wrong economy that we do but what good is that with this huge crowd see this is what we do here's a boy who had some loaves and fishes now we know the story that when this boy allowed what was in his hand to be leveraged, God took what was something small, transformed that into something miraculous that we're talking about it today. But see, they did the wrong accounting. They looked at it and said, doesn't have much in his hand. I mean, how's that going to accomplish anything? Some of us live in that same space. We're doing the wrong inventory. We look what's in our hand. We compare it. Again, we think, I don't have anything. God says, don't get focused on what you don't have. Just leverage what you do. Start serving, volunteering with that. Start offering that. And watch how I'll use that to accomplish something amazing. Let me give you another one. One of the most amazing stories that we find with Jesus as he was bringing so much dignity and honor to women all around him. Jesus had a, a very loving, intentional way to bring honor and dignity to the women that were being marginalized, abused, and treated unfairly. Here's the story of another woman. In Matthew chapter 26, Verse six, it says this, while Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured out on his head as he was reclining at the table. What did she have in her hand? Very expensive perfume. And what did she do with that? She didn't take it for herself. She didn't say, oh, I, I don't want to use this on Jesus. Like, I don't want to waste that. I mean, maybe I'll give Jesus a little, a little sampling of it. What did she do? No, she took all of that. She poured out what was in her hand to love and serve Jesus. To some people, it was seen as squandering. See, sometimes we do the wrong accounting where we go, oh, I have a lot in my hand, my resources, my time, my money, my wealth, my influence. And we go, oh, I'll give God a little bit. But when we know, we take everything we have in our hand and we go, it's all going to be leveraged. Not 10%, 20%. She lavished it all. She dumped that on Jesus. And watch Jesus' response as a rebuttal to their complaint that she did this. I love it. Verse 10 says this. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured out this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for my burial. And I love this next part of the verse here. Verse 13, truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Don't you love that? This woman now has a legacy. We're talking about her today. And Jesus promised that that would happen because one woman took what was in her hand, and she didn't reserve it. She didn't hold anything back. She said, I'm going to leverage everything I have, even something like perfume, for his glory, for his blessing. And now she lives out the legacy of her destiny. 
that God would be blessed. The son was actually blessed by her before death, burial, and resurrection. You know, I can keep going on throughout the Bible. There's always these stories. It's a consistent theme. Whenever we take what's in our hand and we leverage that, God takes something that may seem insignificant and turn it into something supernatural and it will let you live out your destiny and thrive. And maybe perhaps the greatest example of somebody leveraging what's in their hand was when Jesus put his hands on the cross and allowed his palms to be nailed to a cross for your life and my life for all eternity. Jesus, what he had in his hands was the nails of death that he leveraged for your life and my life. If Jesus can open up his palms and allow them to be nailed to a cross, and if that's what he held in his hands to leverage the cross at his death and his resurrection for your life and my life to thrive, how much more should we take what's in the palms of our hands, what we own, our resources, everything we have, to leverage that, let him transform them supernaturally, and we will walk in our destiny and purpose and calling, and it'll be a life of thriving. Next week, I'm going to talk more. How do we actually discover what's in our hand? But right now, would you just pray with me as we wrap up? Here's what I'd love for you to do. Would you just close your eyes wherever you're at? And I want you just to hold out your palms. This is a symbol. And maybe just pray this prayer with me in agreement as we close. Jesus, I want to live a life where I leverage everything for you, for your glory, for your purpose, for your plan. Jesus, help me with two things right now. Jesus, help me, first of all, trust you that whatever I have in my hand, which may seem insignificant, which may seem nothing, I don't have the skills, I don't have the qualification, I don't have this and that, but Jesus, help me today take whatever I have and trust you that you will take it and transform it supernaturally, that you'll move something from ordinary to extraordinary, when I leverage what I have for you. And number two, Jesus, may I never, may I never be closed fisted with the things that you put in my hands. May I surrender fully to you. May I never hold anything back. May I leverage not 10%, but may I leverage 100% of my life for your glory. And I know when I do that, that great things will happen. I'll step into my destiny, the things you predetermined for me to walk in and it will lead me to a life of thriving. I pray, Jesus, today, help me do that. Help me live that out. Would you bless that? Give me the courage and trust in you to do that. And I pray this now in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I'm excited for you guys. I believe supernatural things will happen in your life when we leverage within our hands. 